the United States is an exceptional nation um, for reasons other than what politicians are telling you um, this year as we go into a presidential election. The United States is exceptional because it was founded on a set of ideas um, which we call the American Creed, but actually they're universal values that can be purchased by any country. What's unique is that the United States got there first. I'm referring to democracy, liberty, individual, individualism, egalitarianism, equality of all men and women under the law, limited government, um, property rights. These basket, baskets of ideas are the ones that constitute the American creed. The U.S. again is exceptional because it has been committed to those ideas from its founding. It fought a revolution on the basis of those ideas when it had not a clear sense of what the institutions would look like that would in fact um, be needed to implement those ideas in public policy. So the United States is not exceptional because it's particularly good, it's not normative. Um, it doesn't always live up to those ideas. And what's most important, I think, about American exceptionalism is the fact that there is an inherent intention between and among some of the ideas that constitute the American creed. For example, between egalitarianism and individual rights. The working out of the tension between um, some of these ideas in the American creed is what makes the United States so exceptional and so unique not just the fact that it works out that tension very publicly, but it does so consciously and consistently, and that one side never dominates um, too long over another. That's what makes the United States an exceptional nation. Not that it's better, but that it has gotten to a set of universal values early in its history, and that it continues to define the country today the great challenge facing the United States is whether it will continue to be an exceptional nation, whether it will continue to debate openly and consciously the tension between the very ideas it holds, whether Americans will consciously and in a forthright way admit that sometimes the country tilts toward um, difficulties even within one of those values. It's not always egalitarianism. Sometimes it's e inegalitarian in its behavior. That's what makes the United States unique. The challenge now is to see if the country can get beyond um, just um, to get talking about the U.S. in a normative sense and get to the positive arguments that need to be made. If the United States is unable to continue to have that tension and be open about it, and instead of having attention, have a stalemate, it's unlikely that the U.S. will be an exceptional nation. Let's review some of the ways in which um, American exceptionalism through the American creed has defined the very core of what this nation is about. Let's start with the obvious, race and rights in America. In some way, I think Du Bois was right. Every presidential election in the United States has gone to the core issue of race and rights. I can't think of a presidential election in which that was not either, either explicit or a subtext for what the candidates were talking about. The, um, the main constitution of the U.S., and I say the main because it really wasn't the first, but it's the one that we talk about today as our constitution. Um, in its original form, it described um, African Americans as three-fifths of a human being, clearly not consistent with the ideas upon which the country was founded. Um, and it took a civil war, the bloodiest war in world history at that time, to resolve the issue of race, not nece necessarily of rights, but of race. And the 13, 14, and 15 amendments, of which I'm so thankful for, that attempted to make the country consistent with what it said it was. But then it took a whole century after that to get um, the American South and parts of the North as well to live up to what those amendments and others in the Constitution said about race and rights. Um, to end the ideological battle that would make the country inegalitarian, um, not illiberal, was something that took a very long time in the United States. So on the whole issue of race and rights, the United States isn't finished. 
in the past 15 years or so, the Supreme Court in a number of important judicial decrees has said that um, race um, balancing um, through gerrymandering, itself an attempt um, to rebalance some of the issues of how our districts um, are, 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 are composed in the U.S. Um, is unconstitutional and could lead to, to white victimization. This issue is of race and rights is not over. But the fact that the United States does it publicly, that it does it all the time, that it keeps going back and forth, makes it different and exceptional from other nations. The limited government, we hear a lot of debate about that now from the Republican presidential field. Um, how big should government be? That's one of the mantras of the Tea Party. We want small government, limited government. That's what the founders want, wanted. Well, that's true, but also there's a deeper story about the role of government in the United States. Uh, government was limited initially. The first constitution, the Articles of Confederation, to say that it was about limited government is to be very kind. To say that it was about states' rights is to really miss the point of the fact that the original colonists wanted little, as little central governance as possible. And then when something came along, like the Shays' Rebellion, it was clear that the country could not survive under a constitution where there was almost no federal authority, where all the power inherited in the states. So the whole idea of limited government is clearly part of the American founding. But when we get to the next constitution, that has many, many amendments, we see a greater tension between that original idea of very limited government and a deeper understanding of the responsibilities of a growing country that would play a central role, um, if not the main role in the international system, that would include stronger central government. We've had both things and both have worked very effectively in the United States. I don't believe that any serious political conservative in the U.S. would oppose the GI Bill, for example, after World War II, after the Korean War. I would not be standing before you today were it not for the GI Bill, which helped put my family into the middle class, and the post-9-11 GI Bill, which will allow um, um, thousands upon thousands of servicemen and their families to get education, to get homes, um, to make sure that they find a safe place in the middle class in the United States. That's what the national government has done. There are other things, the National Defense Education Act of 1954, of which I learned about from engineers and computer scientists at, at Carnegie Mellon. It radically helped change the American university. Um, I know that K through 12 in the U.S. has become somewhat of a disaster, um, but 13 and above, the United States is still the leader in higher education, and it's largely due to things like the National Defense Education Act of 58 coming after Sputnik, a direct attempt by the federal government to enhance um, research universities and education and research and science and math in a way that no government before had infused dollars into research universities. It changed the, the structure of U.S. education. It helped build the middle class. It helped lead to innovation. It made possible things like Silicon Valley and all of the spinoffs that come out of university research labs. The U.S. government helped transform the U.S. university and is part of the reason that Probably, though I don't have all the numbers of the top research universities in the world, I'd say a lion's share are still in the U.S. Um, Chinese and others are, are catching up. The polio va vaccine, and you may wonder why I want to talk about national security, GI Bill, polio, all in the same context, because it was, again, a partnership from the federal government to research labs to scientists and others um, somewhat of a public-private partnership, but FDR and the National Infantile Par um, Par Par Paralysis Association was a key factor in making research monies available to eradicate um, polio and to find a vaccine. These are things that the federal government has done, and without it, it's not clear that it would have happened even with private funding. So this notion of limited government versus big government is really a false debate. Having a government that's responsive to the people, realizing that power inheres in the people, that we only loan um, um, power to the government and we can always take it back, 
is still reflected in our second constitution. And I'm talking about the fact that Article I, the House of Representatives and the, um, the Senate, Congress is the first branch of government. It's supposed to be, whether it is or not. The reality is that, and, and from a constitutional standpoint, the first branch of government is the branch that's closest to the people. It's a, not the imperial presidency under Article II authority, and it's not supposed to be a super supreme court, Article III. We can talk about what's evolved in U.S. history over time, but if we look at the Constitution, the way it's written, what it stands for, it's really about the people. There's some limits to government if we stay close to what the Constitution has um, um, stated. Then on issues of sovereignty, if we look at the American creed and apply it to the international scene, it seems to suggest that the United States should be supremely and fiercely sovereign. That's a part of the history of the United States, almost from its beginning. And definitely by the time of the Spanish-American War in 1898, the issue of American sovereignty, its ability um, to have fierce territorial and political um, integrity without intervention from others has been a hallmark of this nation. The challenge to American exceptionalism that we face now in the 21st century is that there is a wild proliferation of international organizations and attempts at international law that would chip away at the core of sovereignty of nations, and in particular, the United States. I would go so far as to argue that much of the multilateralism that we see now is really about the U.S. and nothing else. But remember, multilateralism does not equal multipolarity. We're not in a multipolar world. The United States is responsible for nearly 50% of the world's defense spending. It has a strong standing army, only surpassed in size by the Chinese, but no country in the world compares to the responsibility, to the extended deterrence that the United States provides to so many of its allies, even some of its near enemies, um, at almost no price. In terms of GDP, the U.S. is only surpassed by the EU, pull Germany out and we know what happens to the EU. China, its next competitor, it's, um, it's very far down. The U.S. is double the GDP of China. The U.S. is important as a sovereign nation because it does a lot for the rest of the world. Attempts to fold it into multilateral structures, um, not that they aren't important and that they aren't useful, but the, um, but the attempts to fold them into these structures at the expense of U.S. power actually hurts the rest of the world. There are other things that I can talk about, but they tell me I'm running out of time. So I want to talk about something that's very important, and that's how we fight wars. For most of U.S. history, for better or worse, it, we've had a war fighting strategy of total um, victory, total annihilation of the enemy. It's been unfortunate. Um, what happened to the Native Americans. That was the strategy, but not much unlike the strategy in World War I and World War II. Total victory with total means for total victory. The U.S. has fought many wars since 1945, but it hasn't declared war since 1941. It has moved in, starting with Korea, um, but, and, and more intensely afterwards having wars with limited means and limited objectives, confused means, confused objectives. That's not the way the U.S. has fought wars in the past. To remain a sovereign nation, the U.S. has to fight the kinds of wars that has made it a sovereign nation. It has to hold on to its sovereignty. It has to continue to grapple with the great tension between race and rights, of which allows women's rights and gay rights to be possible because race has always been the front indicator of these. It has to deal with the tension between limited government and larger government. If we do these things, instead of the stalemate we face now, we'll remain an exceptional nation. Thank you. Thank you.